Okay. It looks like we are. and coming into the next session. Um, so if anyone um, wants to grab a glass of water or something uh, just before we officially kick off, I'm just going to hopefully allow a few people to join in. Okay. All right. So I think we're ready to start. And I wanted to welcome everyone to this fantastic, exciting session for Harassus. Um, the session is called Post-COVID Education, Opportunities, Challenges and Public Trust. I'm not sure if we're a little bit premature with the topic because we're not quite post-COVID yet, but I guess that's the point of this um, illustrious panel to talk about the future um, and what the post pandemic world will look like, the ideas and thoughts about the post-pandemic world as it relates to education and rebuilding trust. Um, certainly for me, Matt Jacobson, um, as a chair of this session, um, certainly for me, um, I never expected this to be going on for as long as it has. Um, I thought, you know, this might be an issue for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, um, and then it'll kind of blow over. Um, but this has now been dragging on for over a year. And with that come some pretty long-term systemic issues of mental health for students, um, trust in the system, um, how students will be able to go back into that system um, and pick up where they left off or potentially need lots of reorientation and support um, to be able to come back into a more traditional education environment. So that's really the setup for the conversation. What will the post-pandemic world look like as far as education? So I'm going to introduce our speakers um, and ask them to just give a 30-second overview about themselves. Um, so if we can start um, with Manfred Zoik um, over in Canada, um, if you're able to just introduce yourself and tell us a bit about you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome everyone and uh, colleagues here. My name is Manfred Zoik. I am Vice President uh, of External Affairs and International Relations uh, of Concordia University of Edmonton in Alberta, Canada. And I am an immigrant to Canada from Brazil, uh, German name, uh, European roots, uh, but uh, 14 years in Canada. Uh, I oversee here in, at the university the international relations, everything out, outbound, everything reaching out, alumni, um, fund development, communications and marketing, uh, government relations, industry. Okay, so uh, Tom over in Florida, um, please introduce. It's great. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Um, my name is Tom Davidson. I'm the founder and CEO of EverFi, which is um, one of the larger education companies in the United States. Um, we EverFi focuses on areas that are often left outside of the core curriculum, uh, areas like financial literacy. Um, student loan readiness, college readiness, mental health, um, diversity and inclusion, unconscious bias. We have about 3,000 um, major corporations that license that software for about 10 million students um, in schools across the United States and Europe. Um, and uh, we're backed by a very interesting group of, of investors and have been doing this for, for about 12 years. Thanks, Tom. That's great. It's interesting that, um, you know, some of those areas like financial literacy and bias are kind of separate to the core traditional curriculum. But I think many people would say they actually should be the core curriculum and the critical skills, really, that um, students should be learning. But I think that's a topic for, for another day. Um, so, uh, Pedje, uh, in Sweden, uh, please introduce. Yes, Pei Emerson, Entrepreneur in Education. I founded Kunskapsskolan 20 years ago uh, 
with idea to have personalized education. And we have today about 30,000 students, 15,000 in Sweden, K-12, and then in Holland, India, and Saudi Arabia, uh, mainly. Uh, India is the, the place where we are growing more rapidly. I'm a advisor to Mahatma Gandhi UNESCO uh, Association for Peace and Education. Uh, and have experienced during this time very different change systems because in Sweden we have not closed schools. In India they have, in Saudi Arabia they have, in other places. So it's very interesting to see different ways how the, the, this I will handle in COVID and how you can use that in looking at the future. Thank you. Um, thanks, Peja. That's great. As part of the discussion we'll get to in a moment um, about the effects and trust in the system, I think you'll have an interesting perspective because so much of the conversation about trust is about students have been out of the school system traditionally for so long, um, but you have a different take, which is, um, is there an issue with trust in the system where you've been in school but potentially worried about the health effects of having to, having to stay in school rather than um, not being uh, in the school environment. So very interesting. Michaela, in um, Switzerland, please uh, tell us a little bit. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me here. I am teacher and researcher in the field of technology enhanced learning at the University of Teacher Education in Bern and also at the University of Hong Kong. So I have the perspective from Switzerland, from Europe, and I also have the perspective of, um, of Asia a bit, at least of the Chinese part of Asia, and I'm actually interested in mechanisms of fostering and enabling, enhancing learning um, or actually skill acquisition uh, through technology or helped by technology. And uh, actually, that was the, the COVID area was like a, a, an event which boosted a lot of technological enhancement in learning and teaching. But actually, for me, it's rather important to, to boost elements which has been neglected, like collaboration, cooperation, problem solving. This element has been neglected through COVID and there is a need for catching up for that. Excellent, thank you. And we're particularly excited about having Dwight in the panel as well, because there was a few technical issues that just got resolved at the last moment. So we're really, really glad you made it. And Dwight, can you introduce yourself? Yes, uh, first of all, thanks. Glad to be with your colleagues here, an important topic. Um, I'm actually doing two things. Uh, one, I'm the director of the Environment, Social, and Governance Research Initiative. It's a center at the University of Chicago. But more pertinently here, I'm the vice chancellor of the University of Emerging Technologies, which is a startup that's a year old, and I can talk more about that in my presentation. Glad to be here. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, excellent. And so I'll introduce uh, myself um, last and least um, in terms of the uh, great caliber of, of panelists here. Um, so Matt Jacobson, my accent doesn't sound very American. I'm an Australian, but living in California. Um, I'm the founder of the Desir Global Business School. Um, we're a university group that operates in four continents, um, really with a mission for um, access to industry relevant education skills, um, skills that actually help people in jobs and careers is, is our main drive and focus. Um, and obviously that's um, an area that's massively impacted by the pandemic and coronavirus jobs, um, careers, changing job um, styles, whether it's working from home, um, lots of furloughs, lots of redundancies, obviously impacts on career have been pretty significant um, and lots of challenges for organisations to work through. So um, thanks very much for the introductions. And now specifically in terms of the topic, um, and, you know, I'm not sure what direction this conversation will go in. It can go in a very positive direction or it could go in a very dark direction about the very negative impacts and long-term um, problematic effects of the coronavirus or potentially um, the innovations and new ideas and new ways of solving problems because of the pandemic. Um, I guess it's really open to go 
um, in the direction that the speakers um, feel that these effects has had on their businesses and, and their communities. So I'm going to maybe um, start in Switzerland, if that's okay with Mikel, and just ask you for a couple of minutes to give us your take on opportunities, threats, um, what you believe the long-term effects of the pandemic might be on, on education, um, and uh, a quick uh, statement about whether you're a pessimist or, or an optimist about the future of education. Well, uh, I try to be an optimist just to start with the last question you asked me. And the thing is actually that uh, we did uh, many steps toward really trying to enhance quality of education worldwide. Is a, I think it's a major point in many agendas of, uh, of many countries, but at the end of the day, money goes into other uh, sectors. So I stop here because as we get political, I go back to the, to the actually the chances uh, of uh, of what happened in the world now with this COVID um, COVID pandemic. Uh, there was a massive boost, as everybody knows, of uh, technology for education. A lot of um, uh, session has been transpo transposed from face to face into online. And the fact is actually that um, if you go back and look from a theoretical point of view, which is the the, the easiest way to to, to transpose a sort of an educational setting, which is face to face into into a, a mediated setting, is by trans, trans uh, by by tra um, transition of information, which means actually what the best part of, of doing like online education, like we do now, someone is talking and the other one is li are listening. So that means I my wisdom, I give it to you as it has been done in education for four thousand years. It means you had lectures, you had uh, seminars, but uh, actually the, the activity was low. And that happened also during pandemic because it was the easiest way to, to, to do it. So there was a lot of uh, initiatives where you had talks, you have, you had sort of discussions, but rather information transmission. And this part is, um, will continue, I guess, because it's, it's easy to do that. You can uh, produce it in advance and use it for a couple of times. And that's one thing that I think that will remain also even after pandemic. That means, uh, there will be opportunities for many educators to produce their what they want to say to their students in advance or just use it different ways in different times in different uh, sectors and that's one chance at, for me for education because actually for me the value of having face-to-face -face education and i hope one day we will go back to that format is to being able to interact being able to communicate being able to share concepts being able to argue to deliver um, meanings and that is something this interaction is something from my point of view a very important part in order to foster skills like problem solving like uh, collaboration cooperation and the chance of uh, this big boost of skills from side of the educator to use technology to trans transpose to, to, to deliver information could hopefully remain so that the fact actually so instead of giving talks for hours and days and years this many education may think okay i don't need to spend all the precious time i have in class to do this i can use this time for really doing exercises with them interacting collaborating doing projects things that really makes make sense is uh, to foster skills which are uh, needed for for, uh, for lifelong learning, for, for, for the future life of the, of the learners. So that is the chance. And of course, uh, the backside of it is actually that um, I'm not sure that that will happen. So I think that now it's so easy to, 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 to deliver information and it can be done one to many. It can be scaled up easily. And the core elements of uh, education, which is given to or which, which may be really that fostering skills, I mentioned before, which are not, um, which cannot be learned by just uh, receiving information, that that will be also further neglected. So um, to be to be honest, I'm ambivalent. So on one hand, I hope that this may be may happen. Just means to um, go into the core elements like collaboration, cooperation in the face-to-face -face meetings and trying to have the information delivery over the network. I hope this will happen. I'm not sure it will. And in order to prevent this uh, negative part that, uh, that um, it won't happen, I think it's very relevant to um, educate, to um, invest a lot of uh, time and energy and also uh, money to, to um, 
educate teachers in order to show them how this is possible to uh, to have this interaction in the classroom, to have this uh, problem solving strategies, these projects, and all the things in the face to face meeting by letting them work or get the inputs they, they usually get by the teacher from a computer, from a video. And I think that's the, the, my, my vision of the proximate um, time after COVID. Thanks uh, so much for that, Mikkel. Um, I'm actually going to ask. Tom to respond and then maybe to give your take on the topic. But uh, I just thought it'd be interesting to get your feedback on Mikhail's point around the transition of information um, and whether technology can do things in a way that um, is as good or whether it really should be more face-to-face -face because you work in some of those softer skill areas like bias or unconscious bias. Can you do those things as well in a technological environment or do you really need to be sitting physically in a room together? Yeah, it's a great question. I think we would all um, agree that um, really um, a dedicated face-to-face -face terrestrial experiences um, between students and, um, and learners and teachers and mentors um, is a wonderful path. Um, but that's not the reality for um, hundreds of thousands and millions of kids um, across the world. Um, what technology has given us a, a wonderful opportunity to do, um, as it relates to some of these, um, what I would call softer, but actually, frankly, very, very hard issues, you know, the, the issues that EverFi, that we tend to focus on are issues around um, financial, you know, strength and literacy, financial security, teaching kids about um, exposing themselves to financial products. We tackle sexual assault prevention on college campuses um, and unconscious bias and diversity and inclusion in the workplace. So um, these are things that are massive trajectory changers in people's lives. You know, if you take finance, for example, um, when somebody, we all usually learn these things by mistake. We destroy our credit. We get in cycles of lending and underneath payday lenders and, and uh, usury products and things that tend to maintain cycles of poverty, particularly in high poverty areas and in the country. And um, those are the hardest of the hardest of problems to unwind. Um, and they're generational in the United States. They've been around for hundreds of years. And um, so when we think about building the largest now African-American history course in the country that we've built, um, uh, when we think about the largest financial literacy course, having, you know, millions of students go through those, that is something that could be done with technology. It can be something that can be done where you use adaptive pathing and learning to put students in the position where they're destroying their credit, tearing it down, building it back up, putting them in simulations where they're building savings and compounding and long-term retirement. These are issues to go, you know, you can use technology to scale that information in places where it hasn't, where either because of, you know, in a former life, I was a member of the House of Representatives um, from Maine, and I, and I spent a lot of time thinking about funding mechanisms in schools and the way schools are funded. It's a, it's a, disastrously broken system that relies on local tax bases and stuff. It's very unfair. And um, thus you have to figure out other ways around it. I think technology can be a big, big tool to do that. And we have it in our hands today. Excellent. Thanks so much. And Tom, just generally um, as a, as a comment there around positive or, or pessimistic about in the Corona experience, whether you feel like that will have led, especially in your area where you talk about mass scale uh, distribution of programs, um, do you feel like that's a, made it more um, prevalent and more acceptable to have online learning? Or do you think um, this pandemic has actually created uh, more problems than, than benefits? Um, I think that um, maybe a variation of that is I'm a huge optimist for what I believe can come out of this as people think about broadband access and um, how critically important kind of infrastructure is to kids. Um, sadly, it's played out um, with a ton of inequity on the field right now. So it's unfortunately, like many of these things, it's taken a, a very bright light and immediate light to shine on places where there isn't the connectivity, the funding. And so 
I, I really call on, you know, this is a problem that government can solve um, through E-rate. And I, th- I think the FCC and Congress in the United States needs to, you know, take a deep focus on that. So very optimistic. Um, and I think the, um, some of these are infrastructure problems that are solvable. And then the layer on top of that becomes much more of an equity game. You don't want to have the pipes and then only have the richest districts and schools in the world be able to afford the things that run on top of that. And that's um, a key area that I think we need. Thanks so much, Tom. That's really, really interesting. And then I want to ask Manfred for your take, because you're coming from a very different Yes, thank you. And those for those who joined, uh, I have also an accent, and uh, I'm, I'm not a Canadian. I am a Brazilian, born in Guatemala with European roots, so I uh, will travel. But anyway, here we are. Um, I want to give you a very quick overview of what, what happened at Concordia, which is 100 years old now. We are celebrating the 100 years this year. Um, Concordia went online from the day to the other. We announced next class is online last March. And this, the, the faculty went on board. At that time, we did not pay attention, almost nothing, uh, to online education before that. But, but they went online and fantastic things happened in this year. I must say that uh, there was learning, of course, of technology. There was development. We were able to, to maintain and boost our international relations. We were able to do innovation launch pads with our uh, tech centers that uh, that were all uh, that were all online, and um, we have hired two two uh, specialists to help faculty now because the senior administration is asking what will be if, uh, in the fall now post COVID let's say starting in the fall. Uh, so we are confronted with three things, three scenarios: going back to the old model, just face to face that. I'm an, I'm an optimistic, by the way. That is not the solution. Going totally online, be an online university, not for us, no. So what's happening is that we are developing uh, a strategy of blended delivery that should be starting this fall. And the blended de- delivery can include the face-to-face, which is largely uh, happening in the fall, I think for Concordia as well, and... Um, Blended and online and uh, synchronous and asynchronous activities. So, so we have learned that there is uh, other, other um, dimensions of human interactions that can happen, that, that can happen very well with the technology. But, um, students, international and national staff and faculty, we are becoming tired <laughs> of, of the Zoom experience, right? This is tiring. So, so that's why the blended learning and delivery is, is for us the way to go. I think, I think many are thinking the same way in, the, uh, in education, but, but Concordia wants to, to take advantage of, of the, uh, of, of, of the, um, let's say, uh, new dimensions that came out of human interaction that cannot, um, prescindir in, in, in English, cannot, uh, cannot, um, uh, give away the, the personal interaction, social interaction. So I would say that uh, we will see a growth in uh, confidence once we are back on campus because the numbers are down. I will, I will stop here. Numbers are down of, of domestic students. International are, are steady and, and growing, but applications are down because I think people are waiting to see what will happen in the fall. So when we announced we are going back uh, to face-to-face in, in large scale in the fall, it was well received by the students. So. I want to say this, this is the trend here in, in, in Canada. Uh, budget is not good. Um, in Alberta, not, uh, I don't want to get into the politics here, but not good for, for, for education and so forth. But anyway, we are, we are doing our best here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Manfred. <clears throat> I'd be really interested to hear Dwight's perspective because also coming from a major university background, um, Manfred, you talked about, you know, going online from essentially one minute to the next. All of a sudden, it's like you're not in the classroom anymore, but just run online education. Um, and part of the um, uh, discussion today is really about trust in the system and rebuilding trust in education. And certainly one of the big problems or barriers 
has been that because online had to flip a switch with no preparation at all, it was quite often done in a way that wasn't really the best. Um, and there was a lot of frustration from students. Um, they felt like they were paying for and expecting a really, really interactive campus social experience. And then they ended up on Zoom calls um, to the point in uh, the US, at least, I'm not sure about in um, Edmonton and Canada, but um, even to the point of lawsuits for tuition fees saying this is not what we paid for. Um, so I'm wondering, Dwight, your perspective from a major sort of US university background um, about rebuilding trust in the systems and the effects of coronavirus um, that you've experienced in education. Oh, it's on mute there, Dwight. It's an excellent question. I'm really concerned about the, the opportunities and redefining education, uh, particularly for all people, which obviously uh, we're thrust in the middle of that challenge now. Um, but I think, you know, the COVID-19 virus has shown us that um, in many instances, not all the quality education could continue to take place with distant learning, that students are willing uh, to learn online, those who want to pursue the online option, and also that teachers could be creative with distant learning. I know I've recreated my whole teaching style, which I've never done before. Um, and I think it suggests that as online education, the opportunity suggests for us at least two things. One, that uh, there's the possibility of democratizing global access to education. You know, we've got an increase of, of students internationally who otherwise may not have come through the traditional way. Uh, so the democratization of global access to education, uh, schools like Harvard and Chicago and Stanford and MIT are providing free courses online. Um, there are hundreds of free classes and lessons online, um, potentially in certain cases, actually a student in an underdeveloped or emerging market can take classes at all types of levels of schools in the U.S., which they never would have had access uh, before. And also part of the democratization is in addition to the academic literacy, but it's also the cultural literacy and the linguistic literacy that online education can provide more readily for students who can't travel to Northern Europe or the US or Canada. Um, and that's very important for democratizing global access to education because eventually, if they get the means through online education or, or local possibilities in their countries, they can actually come to Northern Europe, they can come to the US, and they're already predisposed to the cultural and linguistic um, you know, habits. So one is democratizing the global access to education. And the other thing we're concerned about is how to also open up wealth accumulation globally. Wealth accumulation globally. And so as a vice chancellor of the University of Emerging Technologies, which is a year old startup, we're finding that um, emerging technologies are going to be part of what the language of the 21st century is in terms of you know, machine learning, AI, and other things. Industry 4.0, all the smartphones, smart house, smart car, and those students who are able to use online education now to take those types of classes, in addition to others, but specifically emerging technologies, they'll be in a position, hopefully, or better position rather, to accumulate wealth, which can help them, their families, and their countries locally. And they can, you know, in a sense, it could possibly facilitate somewhat of a, a wealth transfer back, actually, to those emerging markets and uh, uh, frontier countries as well. So democratization of global access to education, uh, online uh, 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 opening up of wealth accumulation globally. And um, just finally, too, the, the online education started even prior to COVID. We see we did some research on um, the history of it, at least in the U.S. context, at some point globally, that it was beginning to take off actually in 2016. And so COVID-19 just Put, put it on steroids and boosted it. And we don't think that it's going to be uh, significant. It's not going to go away. That is online education. Um, there's huge demand in the U.S. for it uh, in terms of U.S. Uh, schools, huge demand in terms of, of global schools, huge demand in terms of corporate sector, both business professionals, uh, even more so with, with, with COVID, uh, the increased use of penetration of Internet and smartphones, uh, a lot of U.S. companies, a lot of U.S. campuses didn't open since the 2008 economic crisis. And they have more have even some liberal arts in New England, which you would never think, right? They're closing down the next year. 
So, and students don't want to pay the same tuition. If, you know, if I'm paying $50,000 tuition, I can $10,000 get the same degree on, online. Uh, there's increased more and more recognition that online educational certificates are accredited. So uh, we think there's a momentum that will go past the COVID-19, although I'm somewhat going to be impacted by such a negative and dark cloud. Thanks so much, Dwight. I love the um, <clears throat> love the optimism there, and um, I love the uh, democratizing of global access to education because um, you know education. Um, and as you say, you know, even the brands like MIT and Harvard offering high quality free um, education that is available online. And that's something that would never have been possible in the classroom. Um, you could never imagine MIT saying anyone who wants can come into our campus um, for free at any time. I mean, they just wouldn't be able to resource that. But online, um, you can be in Somalia, in Sri Lanka, and you can be accessing a certificate from MIT on Harvard and and many other institutions. So I think that's I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, one of the things that I think, um, and maybe Peggy, you've got a, a take on this as well, but there's often a lot of debate around campus education versus online. You know, are universities going online? Should they be going online? Should they be sticking to campus? Um, and I think it's not necessarily a polarized debate. I think where a lot of universities will go in the future, in my view anyway, is very much a hybrid model where there will be avenues to access education both in person and online and lots more hybrid style um, learning than trying to decide whether you are specifically online or, or offline. Um, but uh, Peja, interested in your thoughts on the effects of uh, coronavirus and digital versus in-person learning. Yeah, let's say first a few words on democratization because coming from Sweden, it's important to know that, you know, in K-12 education in Sweden, uh, no one pays for education, but everyone can choose education. We have since 25 years back a voucher system. You can go to a government school or a free school. And that school is not allowed to pick students and it's not allowed to charge you one dollar extra. And when you go to university, this is free. I'm also an advisory board for Karolinska Institute and Royal School of Technology, where lots of discussions on how to combine the uh, online with traditional education. But in Sweden, everything is free. Uh, well, it's not free. We pay for it uh, through our taxes. When I found the Kunskan School, and it was a bit different in Sweden because then you only have one very monolithic system. 0.5% of the students in K-12 had the right to choose schools. So we we came, now about 20% go to free schools where we got alternative pedagogical models. And the idea behind Kunskapsskolan was to, you put all the curriculum up in the cloud at that time, and we have developed it in the UK, in the US, in India, and Saudi Arabia, and Sweden. Mathematics, you can do the same in the same places. When you have history, of course, you have two different things. So from the beginning, it was sort of a blended model that each student had a possibility to look, have it in the computer. But of course, we firmly believe in face-to-face -face that's needed. And the interesting thing when you come to Sweden uh, this time is that some of the students that were best but you when you had just face to face during the few weeks when we closed down schools, other students came up. Those were, were much better, fitted better with using the computer and being online. I can take two of my grandchildren one is fantastic now work, being in school two, three days a week and working from home two, three days a week. And the other can't, can't handle it in a smart way. If you go to Saudi Arabia, where we have 700 children from four years up, they have been closed now for, for uh, close to a year. 
and I tell you, it's very difficult to to educate four year olds uh, in that way. But in the way they have had everything on the computer at home, and we have survived that way and seen new models of doing the same in India. We would close down. So, what I believe is that you will get smarter ways of using this technology. You will obviously get into different kind of blended solutions. You will use the technology to realize that people are different and they learn different ways. You will be able to fit the education in a more democratic way. It's not the one size fits all. I just saw today in the Swedish newspaper there was a, a study in, at universities and they say, wait, online education, crisis situation with the golden opportunity. And it's interesting, they have interviewed 2,000 professors, teachers, who did, had not a clue how to use the computer in education before the COVID-19. And now they have started to do that. And at the same time, Kate, today, an attack from the trade unions to say, back as it was before, never change anything in education. Uh, so I think the, the creative debate in that will mean that we will get smarter methods in education, but obviously you will have to come back to face to face, you have to meet with all this, but it will not be in the same way. I can form these situations also. I suggested that once to our country, maybe you go to the school three days a week and you use the location for double ways, you know, it's the maybe you don't need to be there between eight and three and the schools is not being used otherwise. You know, you could increase efficient, efficiency in dramatic way and that democratize education even more. So, conclusion, uh, I see more opportunities uh, uh, than trends in the future if we handle it in a smart way. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks so much, Peja. That's great. Manfred, you were going to um, make a comment there? Yeah, thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, just a quick comment here that I, I don't want to forget. Um, we believing in this, uh, this advantage of the learning of new dimensions after this pandemic uh, is also part of, we, did, we just developed at Concordia a new policy from remote working for staff. So what we are doing is that uh, we will allow staff uh, to, to be largely working from home in the, depending on the areas and then uh, depending on how, how often. But we are starting to say the campus is more, uh, should be the spaces available on campus should be more for the learning experience for the students and the faculty. So the staff can do very good work, but from home. This was, you know, before you were, somebody told you, I'm going home, uh, working from home. You were kind of, yeah, mm -hmm, okay. So uh, no, the work, uh, you can do it very well. I mean, these, these are things that we are learning and incorporating to, a, I think, a better reality post-COVID. Uh, Mikael, you have a comment as well. Yeah, I actually have a comment about the quality of education, first of all, and then of, uh, you know, we have the dichotomy face-to-face -face and online and the tools which are available. First of all, quality education, you were mentioning that like MIT provides a lot of fantastic uh, courses you can attend. But actually what's happening that the didactics behind of it is, as I mentioned before, most of them are about really someone is having a, a fantastic, inspiring talk, and then at the end you have an assessment. And this is a thing which is very good for factual knowledge acquisition, but we were all agreeing about really also other skills which are relevant and important for education. And of course, these skills can not only be acquired offline in face to face. There are a lot of concepts, and I'm actually, that's my area of expertise, computer supported collaborative learning where you can really um, boost this capacity and potential of the online uh, communication and conversation and co-creation. There are a lot of concepts there, but and nobody's aware of it. And that's the point, you know, that's why I was mentioning if the online education goes on the way it went now and through the COVID, because we didn't have time to think about our concepts, about how we want to implement it. That's the bad thing. But of course, there will be online education, there will be democratization due to this online education. 
but it should be conceived in a way that you have a high quality education and not only the cheapest for the for from the point of view of the university means one one professor has a talk and the other one are listening and you can scale up to 100,000 that's not quality in my from my point of view and that was I wanted to mention yeah thanks that's really interesting thanks so much for that and I think there's been some um, overwhelmingly positive comments about the opportunities for the future and what digital can do. Um, I'm just interested as we've got a few minutes left before we wrap up to open it up to the floor to anyone who wants to comment on the question of trust um, and any ideas or thoughts on what we collectively can do um, or what the sector needs to do to rebuild trust in the education system. Um, without a doubt, one of the effects of the coronavirus is throwing education into a a sense of upheaval. Um, students have been restricted um, from learning in most cases um, in terms of attending their schools or attending their campuses, um, except, Peggy, in your situation where students were actually told we're not closing at all and you will um, attend schools, even with, I'm sure, some concerns and anxiety around potential health um, effects. So I'm just wondering in terms of rebuilding trust, and that could be trust in the institutions, trust in teachers, um, trust from the students themselves. Um, what are some of the thoughts um, that uh, the panel has on how we can rebuild trust in education in a, in a time of um, significant change? Yes, I, I can uh, just say a couple of things. Uh, in our context, there are two issues, among others, around the question of trust. One is that people who have access to wealth and connections in the system will uh, use the system to even get even more smart and more prestige and more connections. And so that's a huge challenge because even if someone has uh, internet and in inner cities and they have uh, smartphones, still they may not have the human connection to certain classes of people. So the question of will people who have uh, a disproportion of, of, of resources gain the system again the other thing is around the trust in the security of the systems of different platforms that are providing it, whether or not uh, information will be, uh, personal information will be spread even more rapidly because the more we're on Zoom, uh, the more we're on the line, the more the opportunities that the bad guys have to, to break into the system. So trusting the, the sort of the technological platform and trusting the people uh, access platform, if you will. Yeah, that's a really, really great perspective on the, the technological um, trust in the, um, in the platforms. And uh, as more stuff goes digital, there's more, more risks potentially associated um, with that. So um, any other thoughts or comments? Uh, does anyone want to weigh in on, on the question of trust in the system? And really, I guess, as the vaccines are being rolled out and numbers in many parts of the world at least are declining, um, you know, the question then moves to how do we rebuild trust and, and rebuild the system? Um, any thoughts on, on uh, how, to, how to create greater trust in the system? I think one of most of the things in trust is the, the politicians and those how they have handled the thing. I think if you take education as any, any companies, the trust is coming if leadership in those entities can make sure to handle the situation in the smartest way. <laughs> Be able to adjust and to understand that people react in a different way. You know, some people are very scared about the, the COVID-19, some don't, don't care in the same way. So you have to have that flexibility as you have in any situation we have a change. And that goes back to the leadership, the leadership in each system. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, just I guess in uh, concluding comments, um, firstly, thank you everyone on um, this panel. I think it's been a really, really great discussion and really interesting perspectives. Um, and the kind of concluding remark from me is that this is always an interesting debate around the value and the benefits of face-to-face -face learning versus what the opportunities are um, with technological learning. And for myself, um, and I think for the panel, um, it's not a polarised world. There's certainly areas where being face-to-face -face and being able to problem-solve and collaborate in person um, is really, really a wonderful um, opportunity and a wonderful way to learn and debate and discuss. Um, but on the other hand, technology 
offers opportunities to do things that face-to-face simply doesn't. Um, And we are sitting on a panel, which is a perfect case in point. Um, We've got some great people from Edmonton, Florida, Chicago, Switzerland, Sweden, myself now in uh, California, um, and we're all having a live discussion. We wouldn't be able to do that um, in a face-to-face environment um, without a huge amount of logistical effort and probably wouldn't happen. So um, I just wanted to say thank you all for your great thoughts, your great comments. Um, wish you all a fantastic event for the rest of the Harassus event if you're catching other wonderful sessions and great speakers from all over the world. So thanks, everyone, and it was really great to meet and to chat. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, and stay safe and well. Thank, Thank you very you. much. See, see you all together <laughs> offline somewhere. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Perfect. Sounds great. Yes. Bye.